Hear these words of our Lord from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15, verses 11 through 32. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will sit out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and against you I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be God. Today we begin a uh, three-part sermon series on one of Jesus' most well-known parables, often referred to as the parable of the prodigal son or the parable of the lost son. There are three major characters in this story, the younger son, the elder son, and the father. Today we're going to focus on the younger son and his relationship with his father. Next week and the week after, we'll then focus also on the older brother and and the father himself. Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. I'll uh, always remember the night I became a father. We had been told fairly early on that we were going to have twins, and so uh, that surprised us, and so during that period of time, we began to prepare for the arrival of two babies. At that time, uh, technology was certainly not what it is today, and so no one could tell us for certain what the sex of these babies was going to be. But fairly early on, we heard things like, well, they're, they're big, and they have strong hearts, and so they'll probably be two boys or a boy and a girl. And so that's really what we plan for, either two boys or a boy and a girl. It never, ever occurred to me that they might be two girls. God has a sense of humor. Um, 
So as we waited, as I waited in the waiting room in the hospital with my family for the birth of my, uh, these daughters, uh, the nurse came out. Now, I'm, I'm jumping ahead in the story. The, the nurse came out, and she said, you have two healthy babies. And I said, well, that's great. What are they? And she said, well, I think they're boys. And uh, I said, okay, well, can you please confirm that? Would you go check? She turned around, was gone for a couple of minutes, came back and went, no, they're girls. So uh, anyway, as I said, I had not even considered that fact. And so I was humbled. I was uh, stunned. Um, I realized what God, uh, God has, does have a sense of humor, and I also realized that God gave me, for me, exactly uh, what I needed. Uh, uh, I love uh, Aaron and Lindsay, who are the twin daughters, and then later, uh, third daughter, Allison, joined us. And uh, I love my children. And I love the experience that the Lord has given me as a father so that I can try to understand and appreciate the love that he has for each one of his children. In today's scripture story, Jesus tells us about a father who has two sons. And one day the younger son asked his father for his share of the family estate. Now, in, uh, in the Jewish culture of Jesus' time, a, a son would not inherit from his father until his father died. And so to ask for and to receive this property early is uh, to act as if the father is already dead. Uh, it's a very insensitive, insensitive, a very disrespectful request. It's really a step toward breaking initially the relationship between the son and the father. But nevertheless, the father willingly grants his younger son's requests, and he divides the estate between his two sons, the younger son and the older son. Well, soon the boy leaves home, and he travels to a distant country with his premature inheritance to live his life the way he wants to live his life, away from his father's house. Now, the Greek word that Jesus uses that's translated distant, uh, it, may, it may mean geographically distant, uh, but Jesus might also be describing the son's spiritual journey. He is going away to live a life that's wholly different from what he has known in his father's house. He'll be on his own, outside of his father's control and his father's influence. And wherever that distant country is, Jesus tells us that this young man squanders his wealth in wild living. And just when he spent everything, his entire inheritance, a severe famine comes, and he begins to be in need. He's starving, and there's no one there to help him. All of his supposed friends who he may have spent a lot of his inheritance on, have left. And he's far away from his father, from his friends, from his family. So he gets a job feeding pigs. And I don't want to anger any fig, par fig, excuse me, pig farmers who might be with us today, but uh, we have to understand that the audience that Jesus is telling this story to are Jews. And in Jewish culture, pigs are unclean. They're unsavory. They're not, to be, they're not to be eaten. Now, I know that in our Christian culture, it's a very honorable act to, uh, to feed pigs, but not to those people in that day. And that's not all. The young man would even eat the pods, the food that the pigs ate, but no one would give him any. So this young man is in bad shape. He is literally bottomed out. He's alone. He's in a place that is far from his family and from his uh, father. He has no money. He's starving. He's helpless. And he's hopeless. And just then, Jesus tells us that he comes to his senses. He remembers that his father's hired hands are well fed and that he is starving to death. And then he makes a wise decision. He says, I will set out and go back to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy 
to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So how do you all feel about that decision to return home? Is this young man courageous? Is he desperately, uh, excuse me, is he desperate? Is he selfish? Why do you think he's let circumstances spiral so out of control before he comes to his senses? Is he prideful? Is he arrogant? Is he embarrassed? Is he scared? Afraid? You know, it, it really doesn't matter. Because what does matter is that he comes to his senses and he decides to go home. God has given each of us a unique capacity for self-reflection. We have the, the ability to stop and step back from our situation and to look at ourselves in whatever situation we're in. We can see where we are. We can see, perhaps, where we ought to be. And something in us can be disturbed about the distance between. This ability of self-evaluation is truly a gift of grace. So this young man sets off for his journey back home. Again, we don't know the geographic distance. It may be far, far away. It may be just the town next door. But spiritually, the biggest step of the journey is when he turns around. He comes to his senses, and he heads home. But while he is still a long way off, his father sees him. The father may have been praying for and looking for his son ever since he left. He runs to the boy, and he hugs him, and he kisses him. And when the young man starts to confess his sin and to explain why he only wants to be a servant in his father's house, his father just lovingly interrupts him. He doesn't care. While away from his father and while he runs out of money and his circumstances are spiraling downward, this young man may have come up with all kinds of excuses and explanations as to how he has come to be in this terrible condition. The scripture tells us that he finally comes to realize the truth of the situation when he says, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But again, the father cuts him off, and it doesn't really matter. All that matters to the father it is that his son has come home. He's with him. He's safe. Every element in this reunion of the father and the son is one of rejoicing. The father quickly instructs his servants. He says, bring a robe, the best one, and put a ring on his finger. It's a, it's a ring of sonship and sandals on his feet. Only, only slaves went barefoot. And get ready for a celebration feast, for the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Imagine, if you will, that uh, you are a neighbor and you just happen to be walking by just after the father has dressed his son in the robe and the sandals and the ring. You see the father standing there. He's talking with someone who is dressed in an ornate robe, which is normally worn only by very, very special guests, maybe just royalty. And then as the man gestures with his hands, you can see that jeweled ring sparkling in the sunlight. You notice the sandals on his feet. You smell that fattened calf barbecuing for the celebration feast. And then it hits you. This, this man must be a prince. All the details add up. There's the robe and the ring and the celebration being prepared and, and all this excitement. And so you walk over to these two men and slowly come up from behind. You notice the father's arm is around the shoulder of the man as they walk and talk. And they, they talk, but 
Mainly the father is just listening intently to what this man is saying. His eyes are wise. They're filled with kindness, and they occasionally are brimming over with tears of joy. You think to yourself that you have never seen anyone so delighted to be with another person. You decide that if the father is that excited to be with this man, then he must be a very important person. And so you approach the two men and you ask if you may have the privilege of meeting this most honored guest. And the father just bursts with pride and delight. He would love for you to meet this young man. And slowly the man in the beautiful robe turns around to face you, and for the first time, you see his face. And what you see frightens you. And you're disgusted. You jump back. For there in this beautiful robe and exquisite jewelry and sandals is a young man who who looks half dead. He's dirty. He's unshaven. He smells. His eyes are sunken into his face, and his skin is just hanging on his bones. He, he looks diseased. He looks starved. And you begin to feel nauseous. You can't stand it. And you walk away. You just can't stand looking at him. But the father doesn't care. <laughs> Father's so full of joy that he doesn't even notice that you've left. Although this story is called the parable of the lost son, the parable of the prodigal son, I think another appropriate title might be the parable of the loving father. This story gives us a portrait of God, our father, and tells us about his unconditional love for his daughters and for his sons. Some of us may have difficulty thinking about God as a loving father because of our own experiences with our own fathers. Some of us may have uh, had very sweet experiences with our fathers, some bittersweet, some may be downright bitter. My father died about 14 years ago. He was a wonderful father. He loved me just as much as I know that he was capable of loving but at the same time, there were some areas that he fell short in. And I love my children, Aaron and Lindsay and Allison, with all my heart. But I know that I've fallen short in some areas, some areas that they, uh, that they need. It's only human for us to use the experience that we've had with our own fathers to view what God must be as a father, and we ought not do that. Instead, we can look to Jesus' description of the father in this story, this loving father, as a description of God, our true father. In his portrayal of the father in this story, Jesus makes some very profound statements about God and his grace. God was active in this young man's life before the young man ever knew it. God had blessed him with a comfortable home, a loving father in this particular family, the unearned, undeserved, unmerited grace of God was with him before he even knew about or chose to accept the truth that God exists. God's grace was with him, and God's grace is with you and with me before we ever knew Jesus Christ. Grace comes again to this young man in the pig pen when he, when he comes to himself and is drawn back to his father's house. I've been in that pig pen. What about you? Grace is further portrayed in the patient, forgiving father who has been waiting and praying for his son's safe return ever since he left. 
And it, he accepts him right in the midst of his begging for forgiveness. Father doesn't demand repayment from his son. Instead, he calls for a celebration. Certainly not because his son de deserves it, but simply because he's glad to have his son back home with him. This young man was dead, and now he's alive again. He was lost, and now is found. Each of us experiences that kind of grace when we confess Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, not just once, but over and over and over again throughout our lives. The homecoming feast is also an act of grace. You know, the son doesn't deserve it. We usually have parties to celebrate achievements like graduations and birthdays and anniversaries, promotions, closing big business deals. This young man does not merit a party. He has come home defeated in utter, absolute failure. If we would give some humble thought about how we've lived some of the seasons of our lives, then heaven will be such a homecoming banquet, a celebration, a feast for us. Folks, we are all prodigal sons and daughters. We are all lost at some time in our lives. Each of us has been to that distant country perhaps more than once. We all look like the lost son when we stand next to the holiness of God our Father. We all look diseased because of the consequences of our sin. But when we come to our senses and we turn back and we come home to the Father and we ask forgiveness, God welcomes us back as who we really are. Not feeders of pigs or even servants, but as his uh, precious, precious children. We are royalty. We are princes and princesses. God is our Father, our eternal Father. And we are all made in his image. That image can be marred by our sin, but it's never marred enough or more or to such an extent that God will not forgive us and welcome us home and accept us as his children. I hope you believe that. I hope you receive that grace. I hope you have faith in that. It's the truth. Let's pray. Gracious God, gracious God we gladly acknowledge that you are our Father and that we are your children. We thank you for the grace we have received in our lives. Forgive us that we do not always realize the extent of your love and mercy and are not as grateful as we ought to be. Help us to extend to others the love that we receive from you. Make us instruments of your grace so that some younger son or daughter may feel the glad embrace of your divine heart with thankful and joyful hearts, and in the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. And all the people said, Amen.